this is Alexandra Metters of GalacticConnection.com and today is April 21st, 2015. So please do me a favor, if you're new to Galactic Connection, go ahead and check out our website. We do run a daily blog 365 days a year and it is free to public access. You can just click on the daily blog tab. Uh, we also have a plethora of services to offer. So just check us out. We have my alchemy and the um, infamous implant removal process, as well as a lot of other good fun stuff that we've come forth with, some new technologies. So I am really excited today. Uh, a lot of people have asked me to contact Simon Parks and I just didn't do it because I've been so busy. So I finally did and Simon Parks is with me today. Now for anybody who is not aware of him, even though he's made a big splash out, out there on the internet. He came onto the circuit, so to speak, in 2010 in this arena, I should say. He has an amazing background. It reads a lot like a conspiracy novel in some ways. Um, his grandfather is, was and is a British diplomat and Freemason who worked for MI6, while his mother worked for MI5. He was trained in occult magic at a very young age, and he has many many high-level contacts in the British government and eventually delved into the arena of politics. But prior to doing so, and this is what's really cool, he came clean with the public about the experiences he's had as a contactee with the mantids and the greys and the reptilians. And he openly speaks about the alien hybrid program, which I can't wait to hear a little more about that, witnessing human scientists working alongside aliens during an abduction uh, encounter. He also has shared experiences regarding his own soul being removed and being placed in the physical body transferred to a mantid body, that's interesting, and has taken part in some of the abduction related tasks. Despite his stories of the nine-foot mantid handler that he refers to as mum, Simon has managed to win the election for a British city councillor on the Whitby Town Council. So uh, wow, isn't that amazing? And although he has experienced a lot of attack and malicious um, you know, discrediting from the media, back in 2013, he was invited by the British Ministry of Defense to tour a secret space radar uh, facility in the United Kingdom. So that's uh, maybe clearing the way for him and hopefully having them take him a little more seriously. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce everybody to Simon, who we're talking to in the United Kingdom today. So thank you. Hello, Alexandra. You've really done your research really well. That's brilliant. Well done. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, invited on your show and I'm delighted to speak to you and to your lovely audience. Thank you. I have an awesome audience. They're very enlightened and they really do jump down that rabbit hole. So of course, many of them are very familiar with you. I think I saw you, I think I saw that first four uh, video series that you came out with, uh, that just blew my mind. And um, I think, you know, my very first question to you is, because of the type of upbringing you've had, how has that been for you to deal with in everyday life? I mean, I think some of us are just kind of looking at you saying, well, you grew up in kind of an Illuminati bloodline family, you know, was, was this just the norm? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> no. Most, most people who have um, interactions uh, usually come from a military background. That's generally where it comes from. Um, mine was most definitely an espionage type background. And just to say that you're quite right, my grandfather worked for uh, MI6 and my mother worked for MI5. But in reality, my grandfather was working for the CIA and my mother was working for the NSA. But because they were both British subjects, they had to be managed by the local intelligence service of that country. And Britain and America are an incredibly close country, so they shared the secrets between both of them. So when I grew up, um, I think I was saved by my biological mother, simply because my grandfather um, was leaning towards being a sort of a satanic um, magician 
and his values were along those lines. Whereas my mother was into magic, but she was not into the satanic arm of it. And my grandfather and my mother would often argue over my upbringing. Um, and so I think that, uh, that that was a very interesting division that occurred. Um, in terms of uh, normal families within the Illuminati, yes, it was reasonably standard. So if you went into our front room, you would find a copy of Lord of the Rings. Um, you would find uh, the books that you would expect to see in such a, a family household. Uh, but it, 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 when, you, when, you, when you're growing up in such a family, you don't really compare yourself with others. You think, well, this is how it is in my family. Now, if you're mixing with other families, bloodlines of your set like yourself, it's all normal. But of course, as a kid, you grow up and you meet lots of other children who are not in that family. And that's when I began to realize the distinction and the differences. Um, so it's not something that just happens overnight. You learn it gradually. Did they actually kind of covet you from the outside world? Were you only allowed to be reared, for example, and hang out with other children of the same type of background? Yes, just to a certain extent. I don't know quite in, in the States how it's done, but in Britain, you can, um, in, in Britain, there are mainly, mainly pr uh, public schools. A public school in Britain is a school that uh, you go to without paying for it. That's actually the norm in Britain. Okay. But I was put into a school that you paid for, um, and my own mother took me out of there. I think, again, this is because of the uh, the arguments between how I was going to be brought up. So my mother took me from this uh, school and put me into a, a state school. Um, so I was then going to mix with children that were not like me. Um, so, yes, and it is very interesting because your values are challenged by the values of other families. Yeah. So, I mean, she sounds like quite the rebel considering her upbringing. Yes, she... Um, in back in the days when she was young, you had to be 21, I understand, to fly uh, without a chaperone on an aeroplane. And uh, when she was 21, she actually went and got her passport. And the joke is that when she was at uh, immigration, the guy looked at her and said, well, where's your chaperone? And she said, well, I'm 21, I don't need it. And I've actually still got her passport. Um, and it showed that she went nearly all over the world. So she was very, very uh, determined, a very single-minded. Um, so, yeah, she must have been a real hard thing for them to control towards the end of her life because of the documents that she was seeing. Uh, she became an alcoholic. Oh. Uh, she just couldn't cope with, with what she was seeing. Mm. And, uh, and I've made it quite public that I believe that she was murdered because she became unstable and the information she had in her head would have been very difficult for the agencies. So, yeah, she was a bit of a rebel, definitely. Well, and also if she had a conscience, with, which it sounds like she did, uh, the internal strife might have been just way too much for her to handle. Yeah, I mean, her job um, was to, this is before the days of computers in the civilian side of it, but her job was to type, an old fashioned typewriter, type out documents uh, from a German scientists relating to UFOs that had crashed all over the globe and had been collected by American recovery teams. And these were German scientists from the Operation Paperclip. So these scientists would be given pieces of equipment and asked to um, try and understand what this machinery was. And once you understood it, what's the application uh, in the modern age, bearing in mind the equipment that they had in the 70s. So my mother sort of was signed up to join um, the Secret Service in about 1966 when she was um, very active in the early 70s. And these documents would arrive in German. She would type them out into English through a translator. And as she read more and more, and you obviously know what you're reading because you're typing it out, it became more and more difficult for her simply because she knew that the system was lying to the people. And she did have one conversation with a handler and said, you know, it's not right that all this information is being hidden what will people think? And the reply was, well, you are now part of the system. So, oh. you know, they, they, they made it very clear that um, she had no choice. Yeah. So it was fascinating. And for me as a schoolboy, Monday to Friday, I was at school. Saturday, Sunday, I was at home. And my mother worked from home. So every lunchtime, she would go out and make a meal and she would leave the document on her table that she'd half typed. And every Saturday I would just go for 40 minutes or 
what have you, and read what she'd written. So for three or four years, that's what I would do. And they would have the tape, there would be a spool tape, and it would be in German and then translate into English. And I would listen to that as well. So uh, I was pretty up to date with, with the information that she was typing. Uh, I think now looking back on it, she left it out deliberately for me because at night she had a very special place where she would lock it away. It was very secure. They provided her with all the equipment to keep it secure. And she worked from home, um, you know, and it was something that uh, we just took for granted. But there were always people observing us, you know, security personnel. And, you know, I, I always go through it because it is, it's the hierarchy of it. These documents were stamped in red ink and they had either secret on the top, top secret, uh, very top secret, and in purple ink, purple, extremely top secret. And I think to my knowledge, there were only three or four of those in maybe five years. And every time there was an extremely top secret document, they would be um, uh, what we call a telecom fan, uh, um, part of the, at those days it was nationalized, part of the government's telecommunications service, but they would sit 24 hours a day outside the house. And uh, one funny story I'll say, tell you, is that um, in those days you've got people calling to your door to sell you things, you don't get it so much now, but there was always a trade and uh, the doorbell went and there was a guy, genuine guy, wanting to sell something and within seconds these two guys were out of this van um, and just like came right up to him and just said to my mother who was answering the door do you know where the phone line comes in um, and my mother knew exactly what it was and they were just guarding all the time so in one way it was nice to know that you were being guarded but on the other hand you suddenly realized that you were just a piece on the chessboard you were another piece of the game and that's what my mother uh, rebelled against because she realized that she had no freedom really. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a servant of the state and I do feel sorry for her really. Wow, thank you for <laughs> that. That's really cool to hear a little bit about your your family. Uh, you know, I, I still am mesmerized by the fact that you were so young and had access to that sort of information. How were you able to process that at such a young age? Because I don't have a human soul. Okay. So it, I don't see things as most people see them. To That's me, it was okay. Because I know fairly, you said you're a third, a third human, a third reptilian, and a third mantid, right? It's very confusing, for people, okay. isn't it? Yeah, it's very hard for people who. I mean, you, you know, you, you, your audience is with it, but for people who are, it's a hell of a leap of faith to. I get it's one third reptilian, conic reptilian, one third mantis, as you guys say in the States, mantid as we say in England, and a one third hollow earth human. Um, so it didn't seem at all um, crazy to me. But the, the thing was, it was encouraged. My, my mother's handler was a guy called Paul Dunlop, not his real name. He admitted that was his, not his name. He took that name, that was his code name. And um, he used to arrive at the house with the documents and my mother would go out and make a coffee. And uh, he would then, he was an ex-fighter pilot, jet, jet fighter pilot himself. And I would be what, uh, six or seven years old. And um, he would play a game with me. We'd, we'd get the chairs, we had dining room chairs and he would lay the chairs out like a jet plane. And he said, well, I'll be the pilot and be the co-pilot, well, my favorite game with him was go chase the UFO. So we would play, he would be the pilot. He would say, I always remember it, he used the word jinx. That's what I think what pilots call jinx left, uh, lock missiles, fire. Um, and my mother would come in with a coffee and you think he would suddenly jump up and be all embarrassed, but he wouldn't. He would finish the game while my mother was standing there. <laughs> That's cool. Finish the game, and then he'd stand up and I was never asked to leave the room. So he would then talk about Roswell. Uh, mother had a few questions because obviously being in Britain, we didn't know a lot about the Roswell situation. Right. And she would ask questions about Roswell <clears throat> and he would answer them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, all the sorts of talk about Kennedy, the assassination of Kennedy, um, and what really went on, everything. And the only time I was ever told to leave the room was in the very beginning when my mother signed the Official Secrets Act. And British law is very strict. Nobody else is supposed to be in the room when you sign the Official Secrets Act. Just the person concerned and 
the agent. So I was just was there and just to finish off that I know there was something can hear me all right the um, internet's gone down a bit can you hear me no it, internet's really acting up now I can hear you go ahead okay um, in Britain there was a very very successful television program called the prisoner and it it aired in America and is very successful in America too it's got a big cult following with a guy called Patrick McGoohan and I remember this a this this agent my mother's handler saying to my mother now you are going to make sure he's going to watch that, aren't you? And I, as a young boy, was allowed to stay up till nine o'clock at night. I think it was 1968. And I would normally go to bed on a Friday night at maybe seven o'clock in the evening. But um, he, my mother was under instruction. I had to watch that. That's that just wild. What an incredible experience. And you know, you really made a very good point that because you're not 100% of the human soul, you were able to digest this information without it being too jarring to yes. your psyche, right? Yes, correct. It's incredible. Clarify the difference. This was one of the questions that came in from my audience. What is the okay. difference between uh, the humans that are walking around on the planet versus the hollow earth human that you refer to often? Um, well, I, 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 I'd probably be better by saying what's the difference between an earth human and a higher human. I'm going to be very careful here because I do not want to make people think that a particular human is better than another, I'm not into hierarchy and I'm not into A is better than B and, you know, E is better than Z. But I, I, I want to make the point because it's about spirituality. Um, and when I'm working with my clients, it's actually one of the things I talk about because it's very important to understand that an earth human soul is a person that has a soul that chooses to incarnate time and time again in an earth human body. So in other words, if an earth human bodied person dies and that soul is liberated from that body, it will immediately seek out another earth human body. That's fine, except the problem is that the elite have done a very good job in brainwashing people. And so, so many people are walking around our towns and cities like zombies. And so if a human soul is in that sort of a body, it's given up the, the fight to, to have a thirst for knowledge. It doesn't want to question anymore. It just wants a quiet life. It just wants to be told what to do. So that is an earth human. Now we've got loads of higher human souls like Palladians, Andromedians, those from Cyrus, Hollow Earth, who have incarnated onto this planet from another star system, uh, who have come here to do a job or do a mission. And though they're the ones who are waking up, they're not walking around like zombies um, because they say, hey, you know, I'm connected to source or I'm connected to my home family. And so therefore um, I can resist the programming that the Earth elite are placing around us. So uh, I, as, as a hollow earth human, I am just another branch of the human family that is not a standard earth human. And it's not anyone's better than anyone else. It's just that we and those like me can resist the programming better. Does it have anything to do also with the DNA? Um, yes. <laughs> So you, 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 you've got the knowledge. So it's interesting. It's really nice to, to talk to you because so many people who interview me just you know, haven't really done the research. They don't have the knowledge. So yes, it's about bloodlines and it's about DNA. Uh, if you are connecting with your higher self, and these are the 10 strands of disarticulated energetic DNA that hang over all of us. If you are connecting and opening up uh, into that, then you are able to draw down information in real time uh, from different places and you can also connect with your own history. So if you can do that, then you are empowering yourself and you're becoming more knowledgeable and you're becoming psychically stronger. And this is what all humans have the capacity to do, for God's sake. You know, this is what we need to do. We need to, it's not about ascension in the, in the word that many people think, it's about reconnecting, getting back full circle to what humans really should be, which is having the ability to um, be telepathic, having the ability to be telekinetic, move items of furniture around. How cool would that be? I took a, a delivery of a chair the other day and how, how couldn't I just have, you know, made that chair come in on the back of that truck and just come straight through my door? Oh, that's um, cool. Telekinesis, right? 
Absolutely. But this is what the CIA and, and the old Russian KGB were working with agents for. And this is still what the, the, the Mossad in, in Israel uh, train their agents to do, the telepathic side. So all humans have this ability, um, and DNA and bloodlines uh, mark an individual as somebody that everybody seems interested in. And I just got used to that. Very interesting. Now, wouldn't that be also applicable, uh, depending on the DNA, that is going to, how do I say this, it's going to influence the guidance that they draw and they pull in. Do you agree with that? Yeah. It, well, if, if you have a number of strands of DNA and you connect with one particular strand, then you are going to be skewed towards that particular strand. So let's say, for instance, you have three or four strands and you connect with a reptilian strand of DNA then you are going to be uh, overtly um, drawing on that reptilian energy, which means that you will begin to think and um, have a personality that is slightly pulled that way. And if you don't connect with the others in a balanced format, then you will begin to shift energetically into that camp. Uh, that's nothing to do with having a reptilian soul. That's just literally connecting with the, the DNA. So you can have a reptilian soul in a human body uh, being incredibly reptilian. I uh, remember um, the, 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 the young woman that works now for the Rothschilds, who, who I managed to help, um, who had a few issues. And she said to me, she was only five foot six, uh, and she said to me, how can my small body contain such a big creature? So I said to her, well, draw what you like. So she actually drew me what looks like a, a dinosaur. She actually drew what looks like a stegosaurus. And she said, that is what is inside me. Now, people may laugh, but I know that during the time that she was taken by off-world beings, she would return back on this earth two inches taller than when she left. And it took two, three days for her to go back to a normal size because her, her energetic DNA was reptilian and was seeking to push the human part of her to the very limits to try to expand out. Um, and now she works almost directly for the Rothschilds. So, you know, I, I, I mix with people um, who on the internet, you would say, oh, the Rothschilds, very bad. We don't want to be anything to do with them. But we forget that they are ordinary people working there. And in her case, she had some very bad things done to her as a child. And I think everyone needs the chance for forgiveness and everyone needs the chance to um, make a choice for good. And as long as it's one minute to midnight, I think we should still offer that chance. So I will never turn anybody away who comes to me for help unless they are overtly evil and they have no intention of changing for the good. If somebody has no intention of changing, then please don't bother me. But if someone wishes to um, really make a fresh start, then I'm willing to help them. Well, and on top of that, if they've been born into that family, in many cases, they might have selected that journey specifically to bring that healing upon that lineage. Yes, you know, that's a very good point. We really need to be more aware of that, especially at this time. Yes. Now, you know, you made a comment I heard, and it says there is going to be the most huge release of energy when human consciousness expands, unquote. Can you explain what you think will happen at that point? Well, I'm hoping. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we're, we're hoping. Oh, come on. You don't know the answer? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, what will happen, and it is irrevocable, we are going to do this. The question is, how much damage do we take between now and then? That's, that's the only question. What will happen is there will be a huge a release of energy because we will connect with the 12 strands and we will make a choice a choice to change and a choice to reconnect. And at that moment, we will have access to another dimension. And that is when the explosion occurs, when, when something leaves one reality and suddenly has the ability to perceive and interact in another reality. And it's like a kid in grade, whatever grade in school, and they go up to the next grade. That's exactly what's happening. We are here learning. That's my cat. But, um, we've actually <laughs> learned. <laughs> So this, this, this is what we're all about. It's about um, taking as many people through into the next stage as is possible. Yeah, this is such an exciting time. 
Now, you also had said we are undoing a code lock to bring back the 10 strands of DNA. What is the first immediate shift we will all notice when this undoing of the lock occurs? Well, on an individual basis, I can tell you because when I do my soul readings for people, um, uh, that's one of the things that I check with them. Uh, if somebody uh, is in the store or they're just out and they meet somebody they don't know or they don't know very well, check to see if that person can look you in the eyes. If that person cannot look you in the eyes and has to avert their eyes or you've learned to avert your eyes when you're talking to somebody, it's because you've activated. And I want to explain that. Everybody has a soul. Hopefully, everybody has a soul. And that soul connects through the spinal cord and the chakras to the brain. Now, your eye is connected to your brain via your optic nerve. Now, when somebody looks into your eye, if you activate it, it means that your soul is in communication with your organic matter, and I mean your brain and they will actually get a glimpse of another dimension. So if you are a fourth or fifth dimension being inside a third dimension body and someone looks into your eyes, if they're an earth human, they will be scared to death by what they see. They will be very uncomfortable and they'll quickly look away from you because what they've seen has frightened them. Not because you're bad or evil, but they are scared by what they don't understand. But if that isn't happening, it means that you're not yet activated so the locking is, is the, the, the metagene, it is the locking of the DNA codes. If you can imagine the 12 strands, they have to be brought together and connected. And there are um, protocol codes which are placed in to protect the, the by source, to protect that individual. Because when the um, 10 strands of DNA were separated from humans about 200 and 20, between 220 and 250,000 years ago and placed in an armature over each person. The, the universal law says you can't destroy that because that's sacred to that individual. So what the reptilians did was remove it from the person out of reach. So place it out of phase into the fourth dimension. Um, but, but what it does, it always seeks to reconnect. So when the new age talks about ascension, um, I don't agree with the word ascension. I mean, I, I'm as guilty as everyone else. I use it because yeah. most of the public understand it, but it's about connection. And this DNA is, is attempting to reconnect back into the body and going home really. And that's what it's about. So um, this code is a code. There are several codes designed to protect so that nobody can get at it simply because DNA uh, is a very, very special commodity. It's traded at universal or multiverse level. And when you fly a real spaceship, you have to fly it with your DNA. Um, you, you, it's, the DNA communicates faster than light. And when you're flying a spaceship faster than light, you can't say, okay, I'm gonna press this button and turn left at Venus. Because when you press the button to turn left at Venus, Venus was 50 trillion light years ago. So the only way you can do that is through um, flying by DNA, and that's why on an alien spacecraft, there are no buttons or knobs and there are no electric wires. All of the communication is via fiber optic because it has to travel at light speed, uh, light speed pulsed, so that if you're traveling three, four times the speed of light, then the computers have to be faster than that because otherwise you would be traveling through space and time outthinking the computer. Oh, good. Wow, I never thought of it that way. Well, if you haven't flown a spacecraft, you, how would you know? You wouldn't know. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you for that. <clears throat> wow. Okay. I had um, Teresa send this in for you. And she says, please, can you ask Simon, have we been... Take the internet's breaking up. Oh, gosh, we're not having a very good internet day, are we? No, I think we're talking about how spacecraft work and someone didn't like it. <laughs> Along with a bunch of weather. other Let's things. About the weather. Isn't, isn't the weather nice at the moment? <laughs> yeah. The weather is very are. nice <laughs> today. That's it. It's back now. Carry on. Okay. Anyway, Teresa wanted to know, have we been trapped on the reincarnation loop, unable to get ourselves out? And where do we go between lives if that is true? Now, I know you just touched upon it, but I think my question is, uh, many of us are aware, and there have been so many uh, psychic 
realizations, messages, information, articles, even people that are in the paranormal that have talked about the fact that when we die, we're literally uh, manipulated to go back into the reincarnation loop. And we're also uh, what they call manipulated where we don't really get the contract that we signed up for. We get some other kind of contract. Do you agree with that? And if so, you know, could you expound yeah. upon that? Absolutely. I mean, that's a really good question from your listener. Um, what's her name? Her name is Teresa. Well, Teresa's really on the money, as they say in the banks, don't they? Um, I think that's very important because Walt Disney and Hollywood have done their level best to try and push this idea that when you die or you have a near-death experience, the bright light shines and you go towards the light and you go to heaven. Uh, that's not the case at all. The, the bright light is the trap. So I always say to people, when you are dead, i.e. your physical body's dead, you don't stop thinking. You'll actually just be exactly the same as you are now and say to yourself, I want to go back to source. I want to go home and literally physically turn yourself away from the light. The other problem we have is that suddenly um, Archangel Michael comes to collect you or Jesus or your grandmother. And I would say to people, really make sure is that really Jesus who's come to collect you to take you back or is this a hologram or a holograph if it's a hologram just turn you back and say I want to go home I want to go back to source and three things can happen I used to say two things can happen but three things can happen one thing is that you you get worn down you give up and you go back to the light and you're recycled the other possibility is that you get stuck in no man's land nowhere and you know, I've never seen a ghost, but I've met people who I trust who've told me they've seen a ghost and I'm going to accept that. Mm -hmm. The third possibility is you suddenly look down and you see the earth below you covered in a fine grid, like a fisherman's net. Congratulations, you've got through the, the prison, prison planet net and you can go home now. So those are the three possibilities that can occur. Um, the whole object of this because people say, what is what is the point of this? It's very simple. Human beings have been limited genetically to a life of around 100 years. Let's think of some really, really, really good people or some really clever people. Let's go for Nikola Tesla. Let's say Nikola Tesla lived for 300 years and not the usual age. And he was left alone. Imagine the experiments. Imagine how far he would have advanced science. So that's why humans are not allowed to live too long because their teachings would become law within their own lifetime and also imagine that if you uh, could come back reincarnate and remember who you were you would actually say okay well yesterday i died at the age of 19 i was just doing this experiment i'm five years old i'm going to carry on with my experiment so over the life of two or three teslas again you would outthink the warders of the prison and you would throw off these people and you'd liberate yourself. So what humanity has been limited physically to 100 years or thereabouts and has been limited to what it can remember. And this is unfair. We never agreed to this. We've been tricked. And so it is a prison planet. And the sooner that human consciousness expands and pushes these people off, the better. Thank you for that concise answer. Uh, you know, the other thing you just brought up was the holograms. And I think this is probably, Simon, you may agree with me, this is probably the hottest discussion out there on the internet as to how do we determine the difference between the real deal, the real uh, higher avatar light being that's here to bring forth benevolent energies versus someone who's an hologram or a technological creation by the dark. Well, how would you answer that? This is what partly what being spiritual on this planet is about, because if you are uh, doing some meditation, if you are communicating with your strands of DNA as they activate, when the time comes, you ask yourself, is this person real? Are they what they purport to be? And you will have evolved to a high enough level to make that judgment. At the moment, um, if you haven't gone down that road, then you'll just be hoodwinked by it. You'll just be hook, line and sinker. But if by the time you pass away, you have spent a number of years uh, attempting to uh, connect with who you really are, you'll see through it. So your people have just got to trust themselves. I always say, trust yourself. 
um, ask yourself and believe in what you, you come up with as the answer. That's probably half the battle is trusting yourself. And we've all been so conditioned and, and you know, mind controlled not to trust ourselves. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I shouldn't be laughing, but it's true, you know. It is. I mean, you know, I respect people who have religion, um, and I'm very careful in all of my dealings not to upset people. But uh, yeah, I, I can't be argued with <clears throat> when I say that there, the, the many of the religions of the Christian faith teach that people are always going to make mistakes. People are never good. Um, only God is good, therefore get on your knees and worship God. Um, and my view is, well, um, I would rather not give my power away to somebody else. I would rather try and learn to be good. And that means that I don't want to live in fear, live in the shadow of somebody who might chastise me for being wrong. I want to be supported. And if I do something wrong, I'd rather somebody said to me, well, you did that wrong, but you know what? try again and uh, try and do it right. I don't want to be forever having to, to go somewhere to a church and, and say five Hail Marys and say, I'm really sorry, you know, I won't do that again. Um, I've, been, I've been evil, I'm a, I'm a bad person. Um, I can never be, you know, that, that, that's no good. We've got to actually say we're special. Hum every human on this planet is, is a creature that can create reality out of their thought. Now that's very dangerous to the elite. If everybody realized what they were capable of, the elite government would disappear tomorrow. I so agree with that. I've actually had that same exact conversation. Okay. Seriously. Cool. And we've gotten into this, like, like that went into hours of what we could create once we all realized that. I keep thinking, is that part of what many have coined as the event where we recognize that we're creating our reality? Um, yes, yeah, so it's part of the event. You know, the, the event, part of it. You, no, you're right. I mean, I know, I know what you're saying. Um, it is the moment when the curtains pulled up, <laughs> and then the audience go, "Oh, wow, that's where we are. Oh, wow, that's who we are." Right? Where's the exit? <laughs> <laughs> Get me out of here now. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's the event, and uh, it can't come a day too soon for me. Sooner the better. No kidding. Now let's get back to souls because uh, this is a subject that I like to research a lot. We have found with many of our clients that the soul has literally traveled outside the body, has yeah. been kind of hanging outside the body due to the dissonance of the implants. Okay. Um, it can also be, of course, as you're very familiar with this, the fragmentation from prior uh, past life trauma and shock and things mm -hmm. like that. And so my question to you is, isn't the other thing that you were talking about, the spirituality that uh, we are trying to reconnect with, is fully owning, I, I don't know if controlling is the right word, but not only aligning, but our true soul with our temple, with our higher self, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just curious what you think about that. Yeah, in, in most cases, the soul is in the body. Um, when there's a bloodline or uh, the elite have identified individuals who could cause them problems in the future, they will put not metal implants, but uh, etheric implants, which um, disrupt or scramble the, the soul's informational code so that it can't communicate properly with the rest of the energy body and thus it can't inform the physical body and this is purely designed to slow up the development or throw the person off track but they only do that when someone is either spiritual or is projected to become spiritual in the foreseeable future but most people don't have that because it's a very big operation that requires i don't mean operation as in on the doctor's surgery right. bed but it's a big operation in terms of um actually going about and organizing that. So anybody who has that um, has the potential to, to um, be a very useful individual for the future to bring about balance to this planet. And I would say those that you and I 
co uh, communicate with are typically those types of people. You know, the trailblazers, yeah. the ones that yeah. are creating the new society. You know. I think I think in my case, um, maybe this is a good time to, to plug my website. Shall I do that? Please do. <laughs> Well, the reason I'm saying that is I've gone years without a website and I was determined never to have one. And, <laughs> I didn't want to do it. and then in the end, I had to do it. So it's simonparks.org. And, and it's um, P-A-R-K-E-S. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and people have con con contacted me through the website. Um, and you're right, there's a disproportionate number of these people. But, but why that is, is because they're saying, I realize I'm different. I realized that that something's not right here yeah. and I can't put my finger on it. And I actually need some guidance as to what I what I can do. And, you know, it, it's these people realizing that something is not right. Somebody's done something to them that, that they should never have done. So you disproportionately get people. But then I also get people who have just got an interest in the subject. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so a whole wide range of people are waking up, asking questions. And it's brilliant. It's brilliant that people no longer accepting what they've been told by the mainstream. Yeah, that's very true. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm just, I think we're just a little bit blown away by the uh, the negative impact that the implants have on the soul and the, and the way in which the soul reacts to that by, you know, I don't know how it's done, but ha how it kind of distances it, itself uh, from the mm. physical, uh, what am I trying can, to say? Can I, can I just, just, just uh, is, yeah, um, a it's very easy, true. easy way to, yeah, a very easy way to explain it to the audience. Um, most people are familiar with, you take two magnets and then you can do it so that one repels another. Mm. Um, that's exactly how it works. Thank you for that. Again. <laughs> yes. Okay. Here's a question, uh, from Rita. It says, will there be a breakthrough on the pedophilia issue in the United Kingdom with real action finally being taken and reported in MSM and any other upper echelon political leadership rounding up? Not yet, because human consciousness hasn't broken through that barrier. Right. What happened since the 21st of December 2012, human consciousness did take a big leap. Um, I don't care what anybody said. There was an event. And it was an energetic event. Um, people wanted volcanoes to erupt and uh, the ground to shake, but that isn't what happens. What actually occurred was that people who had been sitting on lies suddenly found their conscience couldn't put up with it anymore. And the elite are finding it harder and harder to keep the truth away from the general public. And this is the big shift. This is what human consciousness is doing. It's actually squeezing out these, these people and bringing into the light um, things that have been hidden for a very long time. So we have an investigation in the United Kingdom. We have some names, but until human consciousness en masse makes that big event move, we will never get to the ringleaders. So what's been happening is that the small fry, the middlemen are being thrown. They're the ones that are taking the fall for this. But the guys at the top, uh, it's like a game we have in England called musical chairs. I don't know whether you, you are familiar with it, America. Well, what's happening is human consciousness is taking the chairs away and the elite are running around and around this table. And there's going to come a point where there's no chairs left. So we're in that process. So the answer is yes, it will happen, but not just yet. And at what point do you think that that critical mass is reached? Do you agree that we have to have a 51% ratio across the world? No, I don't. Okay. Um, in 21st of December 2012, we needed somewhere between two and a half million and three million, that's all, on the planet to um, be able to have that link to another dimension. We got that. So the, the higher self or, or the source or, or the planet, whatever you want, saw that there was enough potentiality in, in human nature and humankind to be able to carry on with this because ultimately the planet could just reject everybody on its back and just as an aside if we go back to the days of the stone age right across the planet men and women had connection with mother earth uh, there was a very close energetic connection and the earth has never forgotten that
So even though now the vast majority of people have turned their back on Mother Earth, the planet, thank God, has not forgotten that humanity can connect with her. So that that is holding us through now. And we got that two and a half million, three million people. And ultimately, if we get 30, between 30 and 40 percent on the event stage, I'll be happy with that. We, we won't have everybody, but if we got 30 to 40 percent, I will be happy with that. So 30 to 40 percent of the seven point, what is it, four billion people? Allegedly, yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> do, we, do we trust the statistics that are presented to us by the which agency? <laughs> so question, you mentioned before that there is a, uh, you know, an actual partnership between the MI6 and yes. CIA and the MI5 and the NSA. Can you clarify what yes. you perceive to be the difference between what the CIA is ultimately focusing on versus the NSA? Certainly. Originally, the CIA and still is considered the, the senior organization. Uh, the CIA was set up before the NSA. In fact, the CIA was set up purely and simply to deal with Roswell and the alien fallout that came from it. It was actually um, st pushed through both houses within three months of the um, the crash at Roswell. That shows how quick they desperately wanted that. But of course, the CIA was um, beholden to the president, allegedly, but it was the president's tool. And the corporations uh, and the elites decided they wanted a more standalone organization that was not in touch with the president. So the National Security Agency was created. Um, officially, it was below the CIA, but it had autonomy from the president. That's why you have a National Security Agency and a National Security Council. So the National Security Council, just the, the four or five figureheads sit around with the president and they chat. And then the NSA meet separately and they're the ones that do all the real work. So the NSA is now totally separate from a government. It is totally separate from the CIA and they don't like that, but that's the fact. And the NSA works almost exclusively with the American corporations. Um, so the NSA supplies the corporations and the elite organizations with the information they require. Hello, Kat. Um, and the NSA on the public figure is the cracking and the encoding of communications. And on the secret side is dealing with the alien agenda. However, what's happened is that the NSA is now at the forefront of the new world order. In other words, how do we control all of human humanity? How do we maintain our position? And the NSA is the organization that used to do that. The CIA are the ones that cause revolutions in Ukraine. If you want to kill a banana republic president, then it's the CIA that do that. They've been re reduced to uh, the dirty job. So the CIA do the dirty job. And um, if I was a CIA agent, I'd be asking for a pay rise. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, now, do you agree with some of the rumors that are going around that the CIA is is losing some of its uh, power and authority and that it's it's shifting gears and supposedly the light has infiltrated that agency? Um, over the years, um, both agencies and you know, I got the, the, the National Reconnaissance Office who control all the spy satellites. Um, go through periods of time where a number of senior people come in and disagree with you know what they're finding and there's internal battles going on all the time uh, but ultimately these people at the top have got a lot to lose and if you are implicated in something dreadful we won't mention anything but if you are implicated in something dreadful uh, you are tied to your organization and you have to remember, some of the directors of the CIA have no knowledge of what, what they do. They're there because they are well regarded in both houses uh, in America. Uh, they are well regarded by the European world. And they are a very friendly, nice person who can go around and shake everyone's hand. That doesn't mean because they're the head of the CIA doesn't mean they know what's going on. Um, and America has moved towards this more and more and more where the people in power are not actually at the top of these organizations, they're just below it. 
You know, I often think about one of the other reasons that they've done that is because the techno technology that is accessible to uh, the reptilian uh, faction, maybe even possibly the greys, to be able to extract the data from the person's mind. Um, it just keeps it that much cleaner for them to be able to protect any secret information. Do you, is that a possibility or? The, the internet is breaking up a bit, but I think I understood your question. Well, this goes back, and if you can't hear me, please, please say so. Um, back to the days of Adolf Hitler, um, when Adolf Hitler employed a guy called Dr. Mengele oh, yeah. to mind control experiments in the 1940s. He did so uh, because he wanted to create super soldiers who were uh, immune to being mind read by aliens. That's a fact, that's why the SS, the Nazi SS practiced on that. But Dr. Mengele was completely around the twist and went off and did his own experiments. And then you'll know, your listeners will know that um, the uh, American administration after the war was so impressed with Dr. Mengele. I mean, I don't know how many children he murdered. Um, and I'll say that again, I don't know how many children he murdered. And the American administration was so impressed with him, they gave him American citizenship and brought him to America where he worked for the CIA. And he was known as Dr. Black, Dr. White or Dr. Green, depending on which facility he was in. So they understood the importance of uh, the ability for agents to be immune to mind control. Um, so, you know, the, the Americans learned a great deal from, from the Germans. Interesting. So obviously they've incorporated the information that they've learned from those experiments, et cetera, with the way in which they handled the government's sharing of information. Yeah. Yes, I mean, the, one of the greatest experiments they ever did was the one on Long Island called Mon the Montauk Project, where Dr. Mengele was actually active as the camp doctor. Um, um, but the, that's a separate issue. But basically, um, they have the ability to read people's minds put pictures in people's minds, almost like a running video. Um, yes, it's quite, quite invasive, it's all nice. And if you've got figureheads, um, you've either got to put special firewalls up so that nobody can access them, or you make sure they don't know anything in the first place. That is just crazy. Well, that's the advantage of clones, you see. If you, if you are a world leader and you're in your facility where you are protected and nobody can energetically get at you but when you're going for a meeting stick a clone out there because if anybody goes into that clone's mind they'll find nothing um you know ordinary people don't understand that's the advantage of clones it's not oh well if he gets killed we've got a clone no it's it's much more than that there's a there's a big big game in clones it's very interesting yeah um, there's some pictures on the internet of president putin and uh, made me die laughing because they were saying oh this this is a clone this is a clone no it isn't because the pictures they showed were three different ears of President Putin. Well, um, you know, that's not a clone. If you're a clone, you have exactly replicated the person. These are body doubles. A clone exactly looks like you. So if there's someone that's got slightly different ears, that's a body double. And that's purely simply because they're trying to um, assassinate Putin every five minutes. Yeah, yeah, especially with the rumblings that he's creating around the world right now. Uh, you know, I've really been wanting to ask you this for a really long time, and that is the whole subject of stealing souls. Okay. And uh, I know that there's a major operation involved within, you know, the black op ops and government uh, factions, etc. And I just wanted to know, ultimately, what is the purpose, other than the obvious, you know, of stealing a soul and supposedly you're not able to steal the entire part of the soul. You keep part of the soul in the regular body and then you steal part of it and you put it into a clone or, you know, this is what I've read. I, I'm just so curious, what is the reasoning behind it? What are they ultimately trying to accomplish here? Well, technically they, they accomplished it a very long time ago, so it's not a technical thing. You have to understand that um, the elite are taking lives. Um, if you come from a very strong bloodline um, and your soul is taken from your body and placed in another body 
who you are then interacting with have to respect you because it's you. Now, some uh, alien creatures don't like the human form. They don't respect the human form. So you take the soul out of the human form, place it in another body, which they do respect. They can then interact with it. It's also about um, as crazy as it sounds. It's like um, sharing. You know, you get college kids that go from one country to another and they do an exchange. Well, you know, if 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 I was a fourth dimensional creature who had forgotten what it was like to uh, experience physicality, then I would love the chance to be in a physical body for a bit. And if I, I was in a third dimensional body, wouldn't I like to be in a body that had the ability to be telepathic? So there is the element of exchange and learning and understanding. And there is also the much more military um, 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 diplomatic part where you take a soul from a body that's high end, you place it in another body, it then goes and has a round of meetings um, and then it's put back into its ordinary body and it's it's very common. That's wild. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, if I ever thought 10 years ago that I'd be having these kind of conversations on the internet, you know, in a radio show. Anyway, look, that's, how developed. that's how we that's how consciousness has developed. You've said it. That's exactly right. That we are advancing. We're not advancing fast enough, but we are advancing. <laughs> it's really well, good. And okay, so just one 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 more snippet there, which is when the soul is extracted from the original body, placed in a clone. Yeah. Don't they have to leave something in the original body to keep it going, or does it just kind of go into like a zombie state? Right. <laughs> Uh, it's it is an electronic process. It is a it's a machine computer driven process, and it isn't instantaneous. It the, the actual transfer is very quick, but the um, the lead up to it, uh, it is a long process. Mm. And I have a very very clear memory of being in a like a pod. And then my soul being extracted from my body and then a device hanging from the ceiling, uh, literally holding, you know, in the in, I don't know what you call it in your country, but we have what we call breakers yards where motor cars get picked up by a grabber, like a claw, yeah. taken along and dropped. Well, instead of a claw holding a motor car, imagine the device hanging from, from the roof and the soul hanging from underneath it and then traveling along a corridor. Uh, and then the body in another tank at the other end and it being placed in that. Uh, the doors are, have, I remember the doors are double double locked or double sealed because the soul might try and get out. So you have a, a sort of a safety area, uh, another courtyard in case it gets out of the first door. What happens is that you put a holographic signature of the soul into the body. Mm. so that the body believes that it still has a soul in it, which keeps the body working, but it can't be away for long. You can't be away for days. Um, Interesting. Uh, unless you have another method of, of, of looking at that. Oh, we've frozen again. Yeah, you we said- keep freezing, I don't method, like this. Do you said, unless you have another method of what? Yeah, there, there, there are methods that a body can um, be without a soul but you have to absolutely lock that body down so that the body's on almost near death so that it's no longer requires any form of function wow um, they don't like doing that because human bodies being what they are when you re reignite the body um, there can be problems that can occur the body may not activate again so they don't like doing that they'd rather keep the body ticking over and you'll be out for short periods and then brought back again Wow. Wow. I, I keep saying wow. <laughs> okay, so back to Rita. We'll, we'll pop in a couple more of her, her questions. It says, um, cool. okay, it says, uh, does Simon's off-worldly family and friends foresee an event of some kind in the next few years that will free humanity from custodian control? Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. You're using the word Custodian. Custodian. Yeah. No, I mean, maybe she's referring. Yeah, we're freezing up again. Maybe she's referring to the archons um, uh, when she uses the word custodians, or maybe she means the Draconis reptilians. Um, 
yes, I do. Uh, but I see it as an earthly situation. I see it as a, a bit of an economic collapse. Uh, the only way to make people, ordinary people, wake up is to hit them in the wallet because that's the only thing that seems to make people sit up and uh, take notice. So I, I foresee some form of financial situation which will then lead people to question everything. You know, I agree with you and at the same time I still have this feeling like uh, Mother Earth is doing everything in her power to stave off dramatic earth changes that cause a, a great deal of loss of life. Mm -hmm. And I kind of get the feeling, just from my messages, that they're doing everything in their power, uh, that when this financial collapse occurs, it, it won't be where, you know, everybody's going to be dying in the streets. So I was wondering no. what you thought about that, you know, like people aren't going to starve to death and that kind of thing. What do you think? No, I, I, I predicted that you go to the, your 24-7 store. I'm always trying to make things American because I always try to be <laughs> as good as the Romans. Uh, you go to the 24-7 store on Monday and they've got loads of bottled water, but no bread. You go there the next day and the complete reversal is the truth. So I, I see the interruption to supplies. I don't see the end of supplies. Um, the problem that the American people have is that when they went off the gold standard, they asked uh, Mr. Rothschild to value their country. And Mr. Rothschild valued the American uh, country by adding up every building, every coal mine, every facility, and came up with the figure. And so if you're sensible, you wouldn't print money over and above the value that Mr. Rothschild said you were worth. Today, America is 22 times over the value that Mr. Rothschild said America's worth. Now, that's a problem when it comes to importing goods because as long as you control the petrodollar and nobody else has the, on the gold standard you're laughing and that's exactly what they did however we've now got a situation where india russia china hungary iceland switzerland are now part of a new world currency called BRICS, which is gold based and america's going to have a real serious problem when it imports from those countries because they just turn around and say, well, I'm sorry, your money is not uh, gold backed. You're going to have to devalue. They're not using the word devalue on the internet because it's too scary. They're using the word reset. But you know what? Reset means devaluing. And I expect the US dollar to be worth 10 cents. In other words, for every dollar at the moment, it would be worth 10 cents. And why is that an issue? Well, it's an issue because if you think about shoes, we all wear shoes, don't we? Well, 80% of the world's shoes are made in China. So you know, you're not going to have the capacity to do that. In my own country, 45% of the gasoline is imported. So there are going to be problems with, with, with fuel. If someone turns around and says, well, I don't want your money because you've got no gold backing it. Um, you see, you're going to have to devalue. And even then, when you devalue, you can't buy as much as you would. And it's going to have big changes and I think what will happen is the public will say why did our leaders let this happen to us and that question will lead on to many other questions and I think that will topple uh, uh, or has the potential to topple many systems and paradigms so although it's painful in the short term I think it's beneficial in the medium and long term yeah and we can't start something over when what we have is rotten to the core we have to start fresh and clean. Yeah, it's a, it, yeah, it's 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 a money-based economy, and it's we elect leaders. I mean, I've always said, why do we elect people by the political party they represent? Why don't we say, well, that man said he'd build us a hospital. I'll vote for him, and if in four years' time he didn't build a hospital, I'll vote him out of office. And the reason we don't do that is simply because you could hold people to account. Yes. And the system doesn't want you to hold them to account. They want to give you lots of platitudes and four years later, ah, don't worry about them. They've forgotten what we told them. Um, and the only reason they get out of office is because the media are told to remove them. So I want to see a system where people are elected because of what they promise and what they deliver rather than the emblem that they wear very proudly on their pin badge. Well, and you know what, Simon, too, having that type of 
mentality that we don't hold our public officials accountable, that is literally um, penetrating all other relationships in society. So yes. it, it's creating, you know, unfortunately, um, also a, a, a disconnection because yes. our value system has completely gone out the window because even on a personal level, our accountability is in, in many cases missing, you know, so yes. it's I unfortunate. Totally uh, okay. I, I took it. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I, think, I think you're right. You're absolutely right. I can't, I can't add to that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. She also is asking, uh, do you see the release of new energies and healing technologies coming forth? I do. Yes, I really do. I think the situation now is it just can't keep the lid on it for much longer. Um, human consciousness is demanding and the planet is, is demanding and um, we're probably five years away from such a release. God, I hope it's not that long. <laughs> I'm not guarded. I don't want to be, I, I actually believe it'll be sooner, but I um, just don't want to alert anybody who shouldn't be listening. I, I'd say within the five years, yeah. This is a cute question. She says, do the mantids have a sense of humor? <laughs> well, that's actually, it's a really lovely question. Um, and it's actually more intelligent than people might think at first reading. Right. Okay. What the mantids understand is that humans have a sense of humor. And when a mantid is interacting telepathically with a human, it will attempt to interject humor so as to be more at ease with the human. Um, mantids don't generally use their hands as an expression, but they've learnt when dealing with humans to use their hands in the same way that a human does. Um, so if a human is saying, um, you know, I won't do this, and they sort of bring that hand. Uh-oh, we're frozen again. Internet problems. Okay, it's working. Okay, well, I hope you, you tell your audience how we're being interfered with like this, because it's, uh, it's okay, just an indication. Um, well, a personal, a personal experience, uh, I, I sometimes, when I'm in a debate, I'll go, huh, when someone says something and I don't particularly agree or it gets me cross, I'll just go, huh, well, they will do that. Uh, if I say something and they don't like it, they'll go, huh, they don't do it in their mouth, of course, they send it through their mind. Now, is that a sense of humour or is that um, a clever form of communication? You were talking about that they actually use their their arm as if to say, you know, to to say, oh, come on, like this. They can do that. Uh, they <clears throat> only do it because they know that it means something <clears throat> to, to most people. So they are reflecting that as a form of communication. When you are telepathic, you don't actually use your hands at all. Humans use their hands quite a lot. Um, but if you were telepathic, you wouldn't need to use your hands. You don't need to um, enhance anything because when you're telepathic, you can send colors and images, um, which far exceeds anything physical. But so when they're doing it, they're just doing it because that's what humans do. So is it a sense of humor or is it just trying to be on the good books? I don't know. You know, it also feels like they're trying to help us be more comfortable in their presence. Yeah. Yeah, they are. I mean, and for many occasions, they, they don't turn up. They go into someone's mind and make them see something different. So many people are frightened by their original appearance, so they'll see something else. Um, I have a member of the family who, who sees them, and uh, this person sees them as wizards, I like Gandalf, um, simply because that's more acceptable. Well, I was going to ask you about that, because I have a personal friend who also has direct contact with the mountains. Okay. And uh, he told me a story. I, I, I was laughing so hard, Simon, I, I almost fell off my chair <clears throat> when okay. he first was contacted by them. And my question to you is, can you literally see the underbelly of them when they stand up? <clears throat> Are you referring to their genital organs? Not necessarily, just, you know, what an actual praying mantis looks like in real oh, life. Okay. 
Right, okay. Well, you're referring to the pilots and the doctors because the, the masters wear a robe, so you wouldn't see that because they have a cloak over them. Right. But the doctors, certainly. Um, if you think of the, the, the praying mantis insect, uh, these, the, the alien creatures do not look like that, the ones I've seen. They are actually very humanoid. Um, they can walk as we would. You don't have a, a thorax and an abdomen as an insect would have. Okay. So they have a the hips and the legs go down exactly as you would if you were a human because they are humanoid uh, they are not the ones I've seen and not uh, as your traditional praying mantis would be okay. uh, but there are a number of different groups of mantis um, and uh, to me the, some of their, their their belly or their stomach area does bulge out a little bit so that's what I've seen. But to be honest, it's it's very rude and um, uh, disrespectful to look at any alien creature in that area and that you would hold eye contact. Now, I, I understand that most people can't do that, but I would always hold eye contact because it's considered incredibly rude, except with the reptilians, a human an, an ordinary human must never hold eye contact with a draconis reptilian. It will kill you. So if you are if you are um, approached by a, a draconis reptilian and you are not of the bloodline, then you you should avert your eyes down to the ground until the creature says it's okay. You can look at me. It's the only creature I know that has hung up about that. Uh, all the other creatures are quite happy to interact on a one-to-one -one level, but the, the, some of the reptilians have a, have a bit of a problem. That is so fascinating. I think I read somewhere that you stated that the uh, reptilians actually have kind of a chivalrous approach towards females. Like they're not as abusive or ab abrasive in their physical torture or, you know, knocking them upside the head kind of thing. Is that true? It depends on the bloodline. It's, it's totally on the soul. Um, okay. it, it, what they respect is who you are. So if you can trace a line back to the Anunnaki, if you can trace a line back to those times and you are connected to the royal family or you're connected to something, then they, that is what they respect. Also, if you are and their enemy and you might be a Palladian, they will respect that because to harm you is to create karma and to create further wars. So, it's, it's a di diplomatic thing. Then chivalry in the sense that um, uh, a female will be treated differently because they want different things from different people. Uh, I think, I don't think I've actually said that, that might be somebody else. It, it'll be the soul that interests them, not the physical body. They are not at all interested in the body, it's the soul. Um, that's, what, that's what makes them interested. So now what about those that carry uh, more of the the bloodline of the Christ consciousness, you know, do you agree that they're they're definitely seeking that out? That they are targeting those specific people. I mean, what is your what is your belief on that? There are many there are many people who have a fragment uh, either of the soul of Christ, and I believe that he was a real person. Um, and certainly the Christ consciousness has expanded and is quite prevalent now uh, at this time on our planet. Um, the, the issue for them is not so much the Christ consciousness, but what is the intention of the soul that it's in. So if you're in a, in a soul that they can easily control or a physical body they can easily control, then it's of no issue to them whatsoever. But if a person contains an element of the Christ consciousness and is as outside of their control, then that is a person of great danger to them because that person will be pushing for an end of the status quo. So um, yes, absolutely, they will have a list, for want of a better word, of everybody that they can get that has this element within them. And they then want to know how they can control that person. It's as simple as that. And do you feel that that's directly related to uh, expanded gifts, expanded capabilities, expanded connections to DNA, that kind of thing? I don't understand the question. Could you please rephrase it? Do you feel that uh, the reason that they're 
looking for, and, and maybe not looking for is the right word, but maybe p perhaps targeting people that have that fragment of Christ consciousness, is it because they have expanded abilities uh, to connect with their higher higher state, their higher self, their, their uh, DNA strands, um, or even their gifts and assets? No, it's simply that anybody who contains the Christ consciousness has the ability to get a message out. Christ was a great teacher and anyone who contains that will also be a teacher and that's dangerous for them because if you teach, you teach the truth hopefully and you spread the word and that's what they don't want. Thank you for that. I'm so happy to hear that. Okay, not happy that they don't want it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, one last question from Rita. She says, do any members of his other worldly clans have a message for us at this time? No, um, simply because, you know, you, and I'm addressing your audience, and we're in America, aren't we? You are the seventh cavalry. Uh, the answers lie within you. Um, you have to decide what you want and you have to be strong enough to stand up when the time comes and make that decision. The messages um, that are around you are simply that the time is now. This is the time. This is anybody who's on this planet now is here for a reason. And you're either here as a silent observer or you're here to do something positive. So, you know, decide which of those camps you're in and um, work for the good. Right on. Love it. Okay, here's another one. Um, they would like to know, where did you come up with the date of 2017 as far as, quote, saying we have until 2017? Mm, because I've been told it by both off-world creatures and the security services. 2017, um, and you know, don't take my word for it, just look at this, the Hadron Collider, the CERN device. They're absolutely busting a gut to get that up and running before the end of 2017. It's the final date for the portal. After 2017, the major portal will close and they'll have no chance to re-engage with the portal. Um, 2017 will be an event also, or prior to that should be an event. And um, again, I'm gonna use an American, get out of Dodge. There are a number of people who wish to get out of Dodge very quickly and 2017 is the final date for them to do so. Now, it doesn't mean that Vesuvius will erupt, the ground will open, but what it does mean is there will be some fundamental changes. And just look at the Georgia Guidestones. That date was something on 2016. Yeah. So we are ticking along towards this, this key date. Um, you know, look at the situation we've had. I mean, I, I don't know what the, the mass media in America is talking about, but I encourage your listeners to go see the 10 senators who've been arrested in the last two weeks and ask themselves, why were 10 senators arrested? Um, you'd also be interested to know that a group of uh, the Zionists attempted to assassinate President Putin over the last two weeks. And at the same time, a hit squad was sent to assassinate President Obama uh, in an immediate attempt to start World War Three. This is not on the, on the media, it's on my newsletter. I publish a newsletter on my website, you may have read it. Um, but, you know, this is what's going on. But take heart, because the good side is there counterbalancing it. I'm not dead, you're not dead, we're still here. There's always hope. And um, these people only live in fear. And, uh, you know, it's got no place in our hearts. Why do we want to live in fear? And it has, so, it has no Yeah, they'll do these either. bad things. They're doing these bad things because they're running out of time. Well, and with that said, you were you were mentioning uh, the uh, ten senators being arrested. Yeah. yeah. Now, do you feel that that's affiliated with the Jed Helm Jade Helm situation? There's a there's a there's a number of situations which are interwoven, uh, and I appreciate it's an incredibly sensitive um, yeah. situation, and I for your good of your radio show it's probably best that we don't talk about it too much I, agree. Uh, I, I don't quite know how how beneficial it will be i think it's just important to say that the, the established media are so in the pockets 
that they don't get the truth. Um, and it's only on fantastic shows like yours that we get snapshots of the truth. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to walk that balance between telling the truth but not putting anyone in danger. That's a really good point. And what I say over and over and over again is we are creating our history right now. Uh, yes. You know, the messages I receive constantly is there are no more rules anymore. There is no more of a handbook that we have to follow and say, okay, we have to do this and this and this and this in order to get this. The, uh, I'm, you know, the rites of passage and all these things that you hear from the past, I'm being told that is totally out the window that we are really literally creating our new reality right now exactly how we want it to be. So we must be cautious as to what we are thinking and especially those of us that are enlightened. We do have an onus on our backs as far as maintaining the stable perception that we are making this into a positive reality. It's very important yes. for us to focus on that. It is, I agree. So uh, here's another one. It says, um, about seven years ago, I had a nighttime visitation by four small greys in my bedroom in an apartment in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they came through a ship hovering in the air outside of my window. And from my perspective, a bed low to the floor, the ship appeared to be a boomerang shaped with colored flashing lights, similar to what the police or emergency vehicles now flash multiple lights when they stop you. It says, I have two questions regarding this. Number one, I heard that the triangle shaped crafts are always the military. Are boomerang shaped craft associated with particular identified beings and if so, who? Okay, let's just go back a little bit, human consciousness. This is about taking our power back. Yes. The, 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 the question I just said, the flashing lights used by the police when they stop you. No, you decide to stop for the flashing Good lights. Point. Good point. So we'll just we'll just make sure that we understand the uh, connection there. And it's maybe a small point, but it's really important. Right, the boomerang craft, uh, the Roswell craft, and that's exactly right. The the, the grey creatures. Um, but not, I would be interested in the description of the greys. Uh, I wouldn't expect these creatures that this person saw to have the great big almond wrap around eyes. Um, there's a group of greys that have not the very tiny eyes, but they almost have heavy lidded eyes or very um, Asiatic eyes. And the boomerang craft is usually associated with them. They are hybridized between greys and reptilians. Um, uh, not, not evil. Um, not necessarily benign to humanity, but you, you're not going to end up hurt by them. They're more there to carry a message or to take you and show you something. So I would say that was more of a, a scientific exploration. So that person, the, 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 the person who's answered that, asked that question, probably gained more from it that was useful, I think. Okay, her next question, this is Barbara. She says, do Pleiadians use small greys to make contact with humans on Earth? No, absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. They would never dream of doing that. Okay, well, there you go. She says, I asked this because following the incident when I asked who they were, I telepathically heard Pleiadians and I realized this might not be accurate. They're lying to her, absolutely lying. Wow. So now, I had brought this up before. It says, uh, this is from Greg. It says, Simon says that his soul is a third mantid, a third Draco, and a third inner earth. Perhaps it's semantics, but my understanding of the soul is that it is not a vehicle related in this way. Please go into detail as to what is meant by your soul being divided into the species and the vehicles of the species. Okay, I, I never used the word divided, but I understand what, what he's asking. Um, soul is usually created by source. It's a divine creation um, and it should always be and it is. They can't create souls, only source can make souls. And generally a soul is created of one uh, item but it will incarnate in a body and the body that it incarnates in is going to be the body that it associates with. So if a soul is created and its first body is a Palladian then we can say that that soul has chosen to incarnate in a Palladian body, therefore when it incarnates again it is a Palladian soul. Uh, there are 
off-world groups that have the technology both in the, the electronic side and also in the brain capacity side to graft other elements of soul onto the major soul. This is a travesty. Um, it is not really allowed but goes on just as hunting ivory, killing elephants is illegal but yet it is done. And so alien groups will uh, mix and match uh, when they are seeking to um, interact or share in certain individuals or individuals potentiality. So in my case, um, uh, actually I, I've come across many people who are 50% human and 50% reptilian from the soul's perspective. That's actually much more common than you would think. Um, what's less common is to have the mantid part also. So I don't want your listeners to think of a soul with three bits and you could see lines. <laughs> Okay. It is, it is uh, one soul with three elements to it. And as somebody who is very, very knowledgeable said when they met me, uh, my God, they have spent a huge amount of effort and time on you because it works, i.e. you work, your body's not falling apart. Um, you know, all your parts are accepting each other and working together. And that must mean on a much higher level, on a source level, I've accepted and agreed to it mm -hmm. because I'm not resisting or fighting it. This is me, this is who I am. Um, and we've got to be very careful we don't get hung up with that. It's not what you are, it's what you be. In other words, what are you actually doing? You might have a, a, a history of working in the Vatican. And people may think you're very bad, but you may be a very good person. So we don't judge, we judge on the person's actions. Um, I hope that answers the question. You were basically talking about if they work within the Vatican, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person. That's what you said. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we judge them by their actions, not by their history. Yeah. And, and at this final hour, that's really, you know, what I say many times to people is stop getting so hung up on, you know, uh, well, they said this, so they're really bad because they said this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we are really being um, honed right now to start learning to accept other people's truth and to learn yes. to agree to disagree. You know, it's yes. much, much like right now. Uh, let me see. This, this is a question about the uh, Hadron Collider in Europe. Okay. And she wanted to know what is the true purpose of it and if you have any comments on um, how this is going to impact our future? Well, hopefully it won't. Um, it has a number of purposes. One was to change the timeline and prevent the 21st of December 2012. That was its primary purpose at that time, to prevent uh, the ascension process. And it didn't work and everybody hopefully who's listened to me knows that it didn't work. It broke down for nearly um, they've just added 26 miles of tubing. Can you still hear me? Are we they losing added, it? added 26 miles of tubing? Yes, 26 miles of tubing to increase its power outage. Um, it uh, can be used as a time machine to try to push the Earth onto a separate timeline. It can also be used as a weapon. In other words, um, it can project a beam into space. So it has a whole wide range of things. Uh, it, when it was first built, they announced it cost one billion dollars. And uh, the latest uh, report, they're finally being more truthful, is so far we're up to ten billion dollars. Wow. And what's interesting is that no corporation owns it. Um, no corporation would give you ten billion dollars because their first question is, what do I get back? There's nothing back from this. So all the countries in the West are raiding their black budgets to pay for this. And it's a very negative device. It will not push science forward and, and it just won't work. It's not going to be allowed to work and that's the end of it. It's a waste of time, total waste of time. You know, and I would also think that uh, they are not, you know, the countries and the companies are not wanting to put their name on it in case it, they have blood on their hands. You know, if you think about it from that standpoint. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You want to be accountable. Here we go again. <laughs> Exactly. It's something that's so out of their 
uh, knowledge anyway that they they wouldn't actually be involved in it because they don't understand a practical um, practicality or something that will make money for them in the end. It won't make anybody any money. Uh, so, sorry, Simon. I just so that's curious. just to say that uh, we're breaking up again, aren't we? No, I was just going to ask you, do you feel that this Hadron Collider is uh, Atlantean technology that's been brought into this time? It's an anarchy technology, which I suppose, yes, through the back door would have a connection with Atlantis. Um, it's basically there's a portal and there's a, a lack of wormhole. I'm using human words here that connects into the fourth dimension and you build the tunnel long enough, it begins to collapse. So the principal purpose of the collider is to force energy up the tube to push it out and to keep the tube open. And they want to reconnect to bring in reinforcements, to bring in um, uh, energy, to bring in um, you know new stuff. And there are elements trying to prevent that from happening. Um, you have a small group of elite on this planet who are running out of energy, running out of um, equipment, running out of everything. And many of the portals are guarded to prevent them getting reinforcements. And that's why that device was taken down to prevent them re-establishing pushing a link through this tunnel. Interesting. Now what is on the other side of that wormhole? Um, lots of scary, scary creatures. <laughs> lots of scary creatures. Yeah. Sounds like, sounds like a bedtime novel, doesn't it? <sighs> okay, uh, here's another question. It says, it's been said that without John Lash's interpretation of the Nag Hammadi material, the accidental creation of being termed Archons and Demiurge and the subsequent capture of Sophia as Earth in their inorganic system would not be widespread as it is now. How close to reality is the Sophia myth interpreted by John Lash and can Simon succinctly explain the anomaly of the Archons in clear terms that reference more than parasitism and artificial intelligence. Well, when Boy, someone, uses, uh, someone uses the word succinctly and clearly, sounds like someone's trying to tie me down. <laughs> Some, someone doesn't believe me. Um, I, I, meet, I meet certain people who, who, who write questions like this on Avalon. Um, we genuinely don't have the time to debate this. Yeah. But I, I, what I would say is that um, the Sophia isn't a myth. It is actually a reality. Um, the Archons are not the top of the tree. They're certainly the top of the tree as far as the human consciousness it understands at the moment. And yes, there was a chance that put the Earth and the situation of the Earth, the Archons way. And they took it very happily because they found that they didn't have to go keep on searching and searching. He was something that perhaps could fuel them for the next trillion years. Parasitic, uh, it's not quite parasitic. I, I would not agree with that. It's, it's about replication and control. The object of the Archons is to make all people robotic. That is why we have such a push on physical technology and we are being told not to dabble in anything that's spiritual. So that's why you have everybody walking around with their mobile phone in their hand. It's an object uh, that if human consciousness can accept technology over and above its own human value, then the Archons can break through into this reality full time and can manifest and dominate humanity. So as long as human consciousness understands the difference between technology and the human, then the Archons will forever be kept out of this reality in terms of uh, dominance. So what they do is they um, manipulate, so very, very quickly, um, Marconi Electronics, mm -hmm. uh, British American company. I'm sure your questioner would like to look that up because it's to do with the Archons. Over a period of just a very few years, something like 22 scientists died. And the yeah. official history is that um, they were working on the Stingray missile and Star Wars. Uh, this is the days of Ronald Reagan. And yes, that's what they were working on uh, officially, but unofficially they were working on a defense against <laughs> artificial intelligence. Uh, it had come to the Americans' uh, awareness that an artificial intelligence 
was pervading nearly everything. Um, they wanted to build a defense network against that. They were successful. The scientists did build a defense system against it. And so secret was it that unfortunately 22 scientists were murdered uh, so that that secret would never get out. And it was placed down as suicides. And the one famous case is that one guy, apparently, according to the coroner, got into his motor car, put a noose around his neck, tied it, having tied it to a tree and put his foot on the gas pedal and decapitated himself. And that went down as suicide. So this is all true and you'll find it on the internet. It's actually there. Um, but this was to prevent the device that uh, can fight and detect the artificial intelligence from falling into anyone's hands. So, so our cons are real. The artificial intelligence is real. Um, and I would just say to people, please remember that being human is the most precious gift you have and no technology in the world can ever take that away from you. Right on. Beautifully put. This is very interesting. Christmas Day, 25th of December. Um, I got a message from a friend. Hey, hey, hey. Cat's gone. Man. I got a message from a friend saying, I can come up and visit. And I said, oh, that'd be great. You can come up and visit me on whatever day. And then I got a message on the phone, not on the standards way, but as if I typed it. I got a message as if I typed it and it corrected my grammar. Hey, 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 stop writing. So it actually said this is a, a, a grammatically incorrect sentence. So somebody who monitors my phone calls so bored. Can you imagine Christmas Day? You've probably got your wife and kids at home. You, you have, you're on the late shift. Christmas Day it got so bored they couldn't help it. So they actually entered my phone and wrote me a message telling me I was grammatically incorrect. Now, no disrespect. This was probably not Americans, but this is probably British. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't surprise me. And take this as a badge of honor because your radio show has been uh, interrupted now three, four, five times in, in our conversation. That is because what we're talking about is hot stuff. It's good and they don't want your listeners to hear it. So you're right on the mark. When the day comes when you're never interfered with and never interrupted, it means you're not pushing the boundaries. So we'll take that as, as a badge of honor. I'm going to go now because uh, my cats are going mad. OK. Uh, <laughs> OK. Thanks a lot, Simon. It was really right, enjoyable. Love. OK, you take, take care. care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you.